Welcome everybody. Um, I'm Jenny. I manage the in-training programs for those of you who haven't met me before. Uh, I'm here with Jordan, um, from, who is the owner of the New Balance stores um, in the Lower Mainland. I'll let you introduce yourself um, a little bit more, but um, he's here to talk about what shoes to choose <laughs> um, when you go out running and for your runs or for your walks. Um, so without further ado, take it away. Okay, thank you. Um, and uh, yeah, thanks for having me. Uh, as uh, Jenny mentioned, I'm Jordan from the New Balance stores. Uh, I own three stores locally, uh, the Richmond, Langley, and Delta store. And uh, we love supporting the in-training program and, uh, and providing knowledge on uh, footwear choices is obviously pertinent to uh, doing a running program. And some people have great feet and uh, don't run into too many issues that way. Other people, it's uh, just an ongoing struggle for them. So, um, I'll try to be respectful of the 30 minutes, although I don't have anything uh, urgent right afterwards. So if, um, if people want to uh, stick around and ask some personal questions and uh, um, I'm happy to do so with them. So um, Jenny said she'll uh, just put some chats in the uh, chat group if you have questions and she can direct them to me and uh, I'll do my best to answer those. All right, so um, I've um, brought some shoe samples so you guys can see those. And, uh, and um, yeah, without further ado, I'll introduce running shoes. So I have a running shoe in front of me right here. This is our popular Fresh Foam 880. And um, all athletic shoes are made up of generally three components. One is the upper of the shoe. That's the top part of the shoe. The next is the midsole. And then the bottom is the sole. And so within all the different categories of footwear, those components will vary um, in their technologies. Um, so with running, uh, the, um, the mesh upper on the top of the shoe is, um, sorry, somebody's locking at my door. <laughs> um, just give me one sec, really quick. Is there any questions you have about this? Just put them Sorry, in there. That was embarrassing. Um, it's actually my wife working at the store today because we dropped off our kids for soccer. Okay, so shoes, um, upper midsole sole. So within running, really, you want the lightness and breathability um, that come from, uh, that allow for um, basically no pressure on uh, the feet. Uh, the lightness, obviously, really important with running. Um, and um, um, and uh, then you also have features like seamless uh, stitching and things like that. So really, it avoids any pressure point areas, um, which becomes a big issue as you are running. Uh, if you have a seam that's in an irritating spot, then those things can really um, hold you back, blisters and things of that nature. Uh, leather upper is used in, uh, in tennis shoes, court shoes, things like that. Running shoes, it's primarily that mesh. Um, so as far as the sole goes with running shoes, you'll see a lot of cutouts because running, obviously we want really lightweight. And so in those no pressure areas or little pressure areas, they'll actually remove sole. Whereas you would get in, um, in tennis shoes, something that requires uh, a lot of durability and weight becomes a little less of an issue or durability is more of a priority than, than, um, than, um, uh, then weight um, is um, you'll have it a full full sole as well as they'll have patterns on those that that uh, are hairy bone and that gives a lot of grip um, uh, on those surfaces for tennis uh, whereas running you'll see flex grooves that makes it more flexible and uh, those cutaways which lighten up on the weight of the shoe um, and then there is a uh, midsole. Midsole is where enormous amount of the technology is. And uh, it has more of the complexities that, um, that, uh, that confuse people um, when choosing running shoes. And so um, the biggest thing I like to talk to people about is just what's referred to as the stack. That is the thickness of midsole. So some midsoles are quite thin in stack. Some shoes are, and midsoles are quite thick in stack. And so, um, obviously, the more supportive, the more durable shoes are thicker in stack. The lighter weight shoes, performance-oriented shoes, become a little thinner in stack. People generally like the look 
of the thinner stacks. And so it's a bit of tug of war when um, people are looking at shoes and are a little bit style focused um, to try to dissuade them from thinner stack um, shoes if they need more support or they need more durability. Um, and uh, foot type, body type, sort of really influence uh, those, um, uh, that level of thickness. And so this would be the 880 is a shoe that has sort of a medium stack. Uh, so it's a good combination of cushioning and durability um, and lightness. Whereas one of our more racing type shoes, you can see there, that's a thinner stack shoe. And so if you're a heavier set person um, and you're running in a thick stack shoe, you're just not going to get the level of cushioning or support or durability that comes from um, because you're going to compress that midsole quicker. But if you are more focused on racing um, and shorter distances and really prioritize lightness, then, um, then maybe a thick, uh, thin stack shoe is appropriate for you. Um, here would be an example of just the ultimate thin stack, and that is actually a track spike, so a racing shoe. Now this one has a little tiny bit sole in the back because it's a middle distance spike where some people will use a bit of heel, whereas uh, the, the 100 meter sprinting spikes doesn't even have that foam there. So that's stack, and it's, um, um, yeah, it's uh, obviously the one that, uh, um, that I think most people can identify just by understanding that thickness. Um, if you are heavy set um, and uh, want more durability from your shoe, get that thicker stack. It's gonna feel better, it's gonna last better. Um, so the other thing that, um, that we um, talk about and are concerned about with regards to the midsole is, um, is some shoes um, build added support features on the inside of the shoe. And that is, um, referred to as stability features. So some people have uh, foot mechanics that are not neutral. And so neutral means they're, they're not rolling inwards or outwards. And so um, if you have a tendency to roll inwards, then we want, I guess, sort of confusing there. If you're rolling inwards, um, we wanna add more support on that inside of the shoe to keep that foot from collapsing inwards because if the foot is collapsing inwards the knee torques inwards it affects the hips and can over, um, predispose you to getting uh, overuse injuries um, and so what shoes will do um, in uh, it, to control that is they will put harder density foams on the inside of the shoe or the medial side of the shoe to control over pronation and that um, is done by using what's referred to as dual densities. So shoes are getting a little more confusing now in stability shoes because they don't color the inside like they used to. They used to always color the inside of the shoe gray if it had a dual density, if it had a harder density on the inside. But I'll show you, this one actually does a somewhat reasonable job. You can see how it's white here and then it has a little gray and white pattern on the inside. And on the outside, it actually is all white besides these little detail things. And so that, if you ever see gray on the inside, that's indicative of dual density. And so it's harder on this side. And so some feet, which we can show some diagrams for, um, Here's sort of a, uh, a little poster of the different foot types. So you can see this is from the heel, uh, the back of the foot. This is a foot that is, you can see this angle, it's collapsing inwards. And that is showing excessive pronation. The arch is collapsing inwards too much. The ankle's collapsing inwards too much. Um, this one is sort of more mild, oops. Yep, more mild over pronation. This is neutral, you can see it's entirely in line. This is what we'd all love to have, um, just because um, it, when all the joints um, sort of align evenly, you don't wear on them as much. Whereas when you have joints that are sort of um, inwardly um, or outwardly, um, 
exaggerated, then there's a lot more acute pressure on those joints. And so um, in this situation here, that's straight neutral. This is that foot that we talked about, collapsing words too much, over pronating. And there's actually also some feet out there that have a really, really high arch and tend to supinate or roll outwards. And so in the store, we assess foot types and really are looking for these different foot types and um, trying to identify whether we have that flatter foot that collapses inwards too much and over pronates. And if they do, then we look at these shoes called stability. And within our stores, they will actually, in our running models, will actually list neutral or stability shoes just to help people. And, um, and some people are very light over pronators. Some people are more excessive over pronators. And so it's the excessive ones that we're concerned about. And we really want to put them into support features like this. Um, in addition to um, dual densities, um, there are also arch supports. And um, there's a lot of different arch supports on the market. Um, as well as people have custom orthotics. So some people have had issues enough with their feet that they've gone to podiatrists or physios and they've built them a custom orthotic. Custom orthotics um, uh, often correct all the overpronation somebody may have. And so um, that's great. Um, and they don't want to often choose stability shoes because their, their pronation is being corrected already. Um, um, so, uh, yeah, it's, uh, uh, off the shelf insoles are not as corrective as, um, orthotics are, but, um, they can help control pronation as well. So some people don't like the feeling of corrective shoes. They'd rather have an insole that controls the pronation and then they'll choose just straight neutral shoes. So there are quite a few options for people to, to explore if something doesn't feel right. Um, and um, yeah, just to identify some of the things on, a, on an insole that you'd be looking for for correction, you can see this has this very flat bottom that actually controls the foot from rolling over. If an insole is rounded at the bottom, it actually doesn't have a corrective feature to it. And I'll just show you, here's a foot that's being corrected by um, an orthotic. Um, you can see this foot here pronating inwards, the angle is rotating inwards, whereas uh, this foot here, straight up and down, and uh, the orthotics doing the appropriate job of controlling pronation. So uh, you can see why we would put, wouldn't want to put a corrective shoe on somebody in this situation, because then they just get overcorrected and cause the opposite problem, whereas uh, this foot we want to correct. Just to give an example of why, or what happens with that foot that's collapsing inwards too much, um, the foot's collapsing inwards, uh, that's when that knee collapses inwards, and those are where you start to get those overuse injuries occurring, whereas the neutral alignment is really what we're looking for. Um, so the other thing is really about fit. Um, so once you've determined your foot mechanics and whether you have that higher arched foot or lower arched foot, or you're neutral, it becomes about fit. And every brand has a variety of fits in their line. Your balance is exceptional because they also do widths in the vast majority of our shoes. So we'll have models like the 880 that will do a double A, a narrow, a B, a D, and even like a double E for women. Whereas uh, the men will do like uh, some shoes in a narrow, a D, which is standard, a two E, a four E, even a six E. So, um, so the biggest takeaway from that is don't compromise the width of the forefoot of the shoe. You need to have that room to accommodate the foot splaying. There's no benefit from a tight toe box with running, whereas a tight toe box for soccer is very important because you're pivoting, you're turning around. If there's movement inside there, you're going to result in um, uh, friction and just a loss of traction and uh, rolling ankles, whereas running, it's very much a straight motion. So you just want your feet to splay, splay, splay. Um, so volume in the toe box is really in, important. Yeah, also, as your foot hits the ground, uh, your foot lengthens. So your arch 
collapses as you hit the ground. It's what's called pronation. That's the whole motion of pronation is how your foot absorbs shock. But what happens there is the foot lengthens. And if you don't have that room in the end, so if you fit your shoes sitting down and you're not standing to check your length and your toes right at the end, thousands of steps over a 10K distance is gonna be bump, 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 bump. And if you're into a half marathon or a marathon or running consecutive days, that repeated trauma on the nail is going to lead to a black toenail. And um, um, there are some people that like they have different shoes for marathon distances that they do for 10K distances just because they'll emphasize toe remora on those marathons because your extremities when you run um, an exercise swell. And so, um, and when you do it for as long as that and that, that weight of the body gravity. Uh, um, yeah, the weight of uh, the body will end up um, uh, causing that uh, that uh, nail to get damaged there, and so you really want to um, you really want to emphasize that. So you basically want a half a thumbnail width from the end of the toe to the end of the shoe. Uh, when you're standing, and that will give you enough room to um, to accommodate that uh, uh, that length. <laughs> I'm a popular guy right now. Um, okay, so another thing you can take a look at is your wear of your shoes to determine foot type. Um, so people that tend to have that flatter foot, you'll see more wear coming off the big toe and uh, even some wear on the inside of the heel. More commonly, even with a pronator, it's the heel strike area and then the big toe wear there. If you have a really high arch, um, you get heel wear and then the wear to the outside. So looking at foot type, looking at um, the wear of your shoe is really helpful. This is something you can actually do as well to identify foot type is uh, you can step out of the shower or step onto a towel or a surface that leaves an imprint. If you have barely any contact in this area, it's generally an indication you have a high arch. This one's the flat foot. Um, so uh, take a look at your shoe wear and that will help as well. Um, yeah, and then fit as well, um, snugness in the back, snugness in the instep, those areas um, uh, you sort of don't wanna see a lot of play coming up and down. Um, and then obviously, like I said, that width through the toe box and at the end of the shoe. Um, orthotics, if you do have them, um, uh, or insoles, they do bring you up a little higher in your shoe. And so when you do, have those insoles, it can create more heel slip. And, uh, and you wanna find shoes that are a little deeper in that area. All shoes, uh, really all good shoes nowadays have removable footbeds. And so um, the, sh the insole can come out and uh, you can customize that with the orthotic or, the, or a new insole. Um, one of my fit, uh, little uh, tips and tricks um, has to do a lot with these. Some, there are a lot of stores um, have these left behind uh, because they have custom insoles. So you can always ask a store uh, for if they have any spares that are thinner or thicker, if you want to take up some volume of your shoes. Um, but I have a high instep and volume is often an issue for me. And I will always use my old insole in a new shoe for the first couple of weeks. And it almost gives me a custom sort of a broken in feel. These provide almost no support. Um, the midsole is where the technology is. So it's not like you're wearing a broken down shoe by just using your old insole for the first while. And then once that shoe feels comfortable again, um, pop the new insole in, take the old one out. But um, if you're prone to a lot of heel slip, um, using an insole that is compressed gets you a little deeper down as well. And so um, that's one thing I find that uh, uh, makes things a little uh, more accommodative uh, when buying a new shoe. Um, some other things that shoes are doing, um, there are some waterproof uh, shoes out there. So generally 
waterproof just prevents a certain amount of breathability. And as I said, with running, because you perspire so much, you don't want that water to accumulate or, or build up on the inside, sweat to build up in the inside. Um, but in fall days, winter days, uh, it's nice to have things that, uh, that give you a little bit more comfort from a water standpoint and, and uh, water protection standpoint. And so Gore-Tex is the, uh, the material you're looking for. And we use that in our 880 series as well. So that's a great fall shoe, but hopefully not too many uh, rainy days uh, left here in, in spring and, uh, and it's back into regular running shoes. Um, also gonna show this model here, it's called the Moor, uh, New Balance Moor. This is something that, um, that is unique in our line and it's more of an innovation that she's been using in the last little while, um, which is called a stiff rocker. So running shoes um, in the midsole will accentuate that roll through the forefoot. And that's designed so that the foot can pivot without even having to flex. And so it's really um, a characteristic feature there uh, in all running shoes. But what's unique about the Moor is it has a stiff rocker. So this shoe actually is really rigid, whereas most running shoes, even though they have the rocker, they're very flexible. Um, so why do they do that? They do it for people that have um, uh, foot issues sometimes, or they're, they wanna relieve pressure off the forefoot. And so there's a number of people that as they age, they lose that flexibility of the big toe. And um, uh, it's some people, it's an arthritis uh, issue. Uh, other people, it's just a mobility issue and a flexibility issue. And so um, there's a condition called hallux limitus, which is hallux is a big toe and it's limited motion. And those people um, can get a lot of relief because the shoe, pivots for them without having to bend. And so, um, and then there's even a further condition called hallux rigidus, which is basically the big toe can't bend. And these people actually almost have to stop exercise, but this type of footwear allows them to continue to be very active. And so uh, don't um, just say, uh, I'm getting old and I can't be comfortable and I gotta stop. Uh, there's a lot of things that can help you with that, whether they're orthotics or footwear like the more. Um, in addition to that, there is things like graphite plates. So we get referrals from podiatrists for people needing um, uh, even more, well, the more does this, it sort of has it almost built into it, but this one virtually, it doesn't bend at all, it's graphite. And this can be inserted into a variety of shoes and it's very, very thin, which allows it to fit in shoes and it stiffens everything. And so, um, people are having issues with that flexibility, that big toe, that can be a game changer for them as well. Would you put that underneath your sole or would that be something that you have to put in? Yeah, so it's, uh, it just actually goes right in the shoe. And so um, uh, just certain that she's not big enough for it, but um, um, yeah, it goes right in there. And then some people will just have a small Spenko uh, thin insole that they'll put on top of it. Um, when they have these things, generally there is forefoot issues that they're having, which usually um, are bunions or things like that. And uh, in that scenario, uh, they're usually getting into wider shoes. So those shoes can accommodate um, this as well as an insole as well. And to accommodate, sometimes you just have to go wider in a shoe as well than you might normally go, but it makes a big difference for you. So um, people are okay with that. I think people at one time, everyone had like one athletic shoe and uh, their casual shoe um, and everybody had real fussy requirements that that athletic shoe looked good and did everything right. Now they're sort of like, oh, that's my running shoe. Running shoes look a certain way and I'm not as fussed about that because I have another athletic shoe that I don't even use for running and that's more my style athletic shoe. So um, there's some good that's come from, uh, from all of that. Um, so some other conditions that people have um, are uh, bunions. So obviously uh, if people have um, uh, uh, a big toe joint that has um, developed, usually that's because somebody's feet pronate too much and they put too much weight on that joint and that joint develops into a bunion which becomes thick on that, um, on that first toe. 
And, um, and so in those situations, we want to control what's causing that, which is usually too much pronation. So we're looking at stability, featured shoes, or we're looking at uh, or sports or orthotics to control that over pronation. And then usually we're looking at a wider fit as well. So no seams in that area um, and more volume in that area. Um, another one would be um, very common conditions, almost the most common condition podiatrists get in an office, a foot doctor gets this plantar fasciitis. So a lot of people starting a new running program, you're adding load to the body. Um, if we're not getting the proper rest in between, you get, um, so the, the plantar fascia basically makes up the arch. It starts in the heel and it fans out to the ball of the foot and you get these little tears that can occur in the, in the uh, where that, that uh, tissue starts and it's in the heel and it starts with sort of some pain in the heel area first thing in the day when you first stand on your feet, but it can progress to almost feeling it all the time and it can become quite chronic. So when you're getting it, it's really important to, um, uh, to try to get rid of it quickly. One of the most important things I'll often tell people, just wear the running shoes around all the time. Try not to be um, using bare feet in the house. Um, uh, try to put slippers or shoes on right as you get up because your foot sort of heals during the day or during the night, it creates these little connections and starts to heal. And then you step on it first thing in the morning, it tears them all again. Um, so uh, just wear shoes as much as possible. Uh, for running, make sure you get proper shoes. So you may have an overly pronated foot and need a stability shoe and our arch support, um, but you're in a neutral shoe or you're in a shoe that, um, that um, is causing you um, too much over pronation because it's worn. So some people have bought a neutral shoe, but they have a tendency to over pronate. That shoe now looks like this. I, I have a, uh, or like this. Um, I remember when I first got into shoes, I would always look at the sort of people's pants and their body and their face. And then all of a sudden I started getting into shoes and now you look at their entire body. You go down to the seawall and watch people walk. And uh, so many people have shoes like this and they're walking and they don't know uh, why their knees and feet bother them. But it's like their shoes are actually causing more issues because they've broken down the wrong way. Um, so um, if you haven't spent a lot of time thinking about feet, Take a look at the wear pattern of your shoes. Take a look at, um, uh, try to identify your foot type and, um, and then go into a good store, experiment with uh, the different options of stability shoes, neutral shoes, and then arch supports. And, um, and uh, some people have to invest more time there. Some people, they can invest less uh, because they have good foot mechanics. But, um, but um, yeah, you'll uh, avoid a lot of the chronic issues if, if you just get fit right to begin with. Um, yeah, uh, some other conditions that people can get, heel pain, which is Achilles tendonitis. So with a new running program, just the amount of pressure that's on the calf um, is, uh, is uh, enormous. And so you can get that in the back of the Achilles tendon, some pain in that area. Um, and so again, just wanting to make sure your foot is, uh, is balanced in the appropriate shoe and more for uh, design for your foot type. You're not so you're not adding that uh, those stresses to the foot. Um, Question has come up. Um, yeah. So the rate price range of shoes can be quite um, wide. You have some very expensive shoes, and then you have those that are more affordable. Yeah. Um, what would you say is the main difference if you're someone on a budget is there, is there like a huge difference between paying like two 250 bucks for a shoe to like 100 150 yeah uh it's you um i think when you're paying sort of in that 150 range um and it has a as a as a uh, sort of a medium thick stack height you're you're going to be doing quite well um vast majority of people don't need to spend $200 or 250 for sure. Um, but um, there are a lot of shoes that are not great in the $100 range. Um, but you have to sort of educate you on what is a good shoe and um, if you're going to go on price. Because I could go to a sport check 
and find a decent shoe there for eighty nine hundred dollars um, just because I know footwear really well um, but um, but when you do uh, go to those stores, there's probably not as much uh, product knowledge from that salesperson. And um, if you base that on price, then you may get the wrong shoe. Uh, so you just have to be um, know how to identify good shoes. And, and that thing, that stack, if it's thicker, that's a great thing. The other things you can do is give it a torsion test. That shoe shouldn't be able to be twisted really easily. So you don't want something that's super flexible that way. Um, you want to see that rocker there as well. And, um, and then you want to see the mesh upper and no seams and things like that. Um, there's a lot of shoes that are sort of, um, uh, there's just so many foot coverings now that look like running shoes and that don't have that technology in them. So. Um, so try it on, don't buy things online unless it's a replacement of something that you've bought before and you know that shoe fits and the size is okay. Uh, and so, but um, as far as like technologies between brands, um, whether it's Asics or Nike or New Balance uh, or Brooks, um, all those brands make really good shoes. It becomes more about fit and, um, and just um, making sure you're in the right shoe for your, for your foot type. Um, and then what's important to you, there's um, like, this is our 1080 series, which is our top end neutral running shoe, it uses fresh foam. It's very thick in the stack and you put the shoe on and it's super, super cushioned. And so some people are just like, I love that um, and I want, to 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 oh, the money's no object with that stuff. Um, I think our best value shoe um, uh, is the um, the 880. Not necessarily best value because it's not cheap, but it's like this is a shoe that people can use for marathons and 10Ks and 5Ks, and it's 169. But we'll often have, and we do right now, have the predecessor. So every year they update these styles. Um, you can, if you have a series that you like, like the 880, um, just call the store and say, hey, when's the 880 being updated? And uh, uh, the new one will be there, but we'll often have the old one. The old one drops in price. So we have the, uh, the 880 version 10 um, on sale for 145. Uh, so that's a, that's a decent price um, for a shoe like that. That's such a great shoe. Um, there's, so, uh, any other? There's also a question yeah. about socks. So, if you're someone who gets um, blisters a lot, what mm -hmm. might that be because of? And and how are there any particular socks that you would recommend? Yeah, or? yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you want synthetics. You want synthetics. Um, they used to be horrible. Uh, they used to be hot and everything else, but they're not now. They're amazing. And they, they actually have a softness to them that just reduce friction and they wick away moisture. Um, I've always been a big advocate of doubling up on my socks. I do that with all my court sports. I play a lot of squash and tennis and I always use two socks because um, the friction goes between the sock as opposed to um, your sock and your skin. And um, um, it does add to the volume in the shoe. Um, and I don't do it as much with running as I do with court sports. But if somebody is getting a lot of blisters and regardless of whether or not they have a, um, um, whether they're using a synthetic sock. So if they're using a synthetic stock and they're still getting that, I'd recommend that they try to find the thinnest sock they can and actually double uh, and wear another sock on top of that. So have that thinnest sock right close to the skin and then put another sock on top of that that's just a regular one. And I think that they would um, reduce blisters in a big way. Make sure it's not a cheap sock too. Some socks, um, if they're not actually designed well or if it's not sized well, it will um, crawl or creep down in your shoe. And a, a proper fitted sock should stay on the heel. And uh, um, yeah, that, that's something you used to see in, uh, when socks weren't as, as good and didn't have as many size options. 
but sometimes people have, like they're a woman small and, um, and they're forced to buy medium socks a lot of the time and it's not appropriately fitting their foot. Um, so uh, make sure you get small socks because there is some stores that will carry those, including us. You know, I realized as well, um, I didn't really talk about the high arched foot. So I'm just going to do briefly talk about that. So, so like I said, there's that flatter foot and, um, and then there's this, um, so, and then there's this high arch foot that tends to supinate or roll outwards. Um, we don't want to push the foot back inwards, but the foot that's really high, it tends to be a rigid, the arch doesn't, pushing itself well, the arch doesn't draw much. And so um, those feet, there's not as many of them out there, but uh, for people that have a really high arch, um, they have a stiffer foot. And, um, and what those feet want is you want good volume here because you have a high instep, but you want to make sure you're not getting into any corrective posting that's going to push out further. And you also want shoes that are really well cushioned because your foot um, doesn't cushion itself well. And so um, replacing your shoes more often is important with that foot type and uh, getting a lot of cushion and the volume. Typically that foot also is a little wider as well. But um, yeah, the supinated or foot that's higher to roll into the outside, we want to give them more cushion. Um, they tend to be tight in the calf and the Achilles as well. So we don't want them in lower um, drop shoes. <laughs> Which brings up another thing I never talked about drop. Uh, so uh, uh, let me briefly explain that. Um, drop is the difference in the height of the heel to the forefoot. I personally believe that a little, it's, there's a little bit too much being made of it at the moment just because um, shoes have adjusted to uh, the really high drops that were happening. Some shoes, the, sh the industry got too high in the drops. And uh, so there was like 12 and 14 millimeter differences between the heel and forefoot. And that was problematic because it actually accelerated the, the rate at which the foot went through the gate. Um, it's like wearing high heels. It sort of quickens your, your motion forward. Um, and so shoes were getting really high, but the average now in shoes is about an eight mil drop. So that's the difference between heel and forefoot. And uh, that's a good drop for the vast majority of people. If you're a super technical runner, then explore drops a little bit more, lower drop shoes, make you hit a little bit more midfoot. And that can be a good thing um, for very fast turnover people, racers and things like that. But the vast majority of us, an eight mil drop, you can still hit midfoot with an eight mil drop. Um, that's the, um, the uh, yeah, it's sort of the sweet spot as far as that heel to forefoot ratio. Um, so all shoes have slightly, well, there's shoes that are 10 mil uh, drops, eight mil drops, six, four, zero drop shoes. Um, but um, those, um, yeah, the, uh, the eight mils are great. And, uh, there was this trend in shoes for a little while, which was called minimalist. It was very, very flat shoes. And um, it was the trend in running to get these very flat shoes, but it's been sort of proven to be uh, bunk in a way and people got overuse injuries. And, um, and it was supported by a lot of physiotherapists and a lot of credible people, but um, so it wasn't led by the shoe industry. It was almost led by others, but um, it's been um, uh, the vast majority of people are back into thicker stack shoes and it is better. <laughs> um, so if you've been exposed to minimalist shoes or had curiosity about that, um, um, it, um, yeah, it's, uh, it's uh, not as uh, an important thing as it once was. And uh, just getting that thicker stack is going to give you a lot more cushion and support. Um, there's another question. So if you're someone who runs three or four times a week, um, is it recommended to have maybe one or two pairs of sh runners to switch between if you run around the 45, 50K a week? 
Okay. Yeah, if you're doing those type of distances um, and it's, it's one of your main activities, then just even from a hygienic standpoint, when you're running in the same shoe all the time and in our climate, uh, things get wet, your feet perspire a lot, the shoe gets dank and damp. And, um, and so just drying out in between wears is a really good thing. Pull the insole out when it's, when it's been wet and um, you'll just get more life out of the shoe. They do say as well, um, I've never really been able to quantify this, but they say that if you have two shoes that you rotate between, um, the, um, the midsole gets a chance to sort of rebound. And they say if you have two shoes that you're rotating, you almost get the equivalent of three pairs as opposed to, um, um, yeah, just wearing one and, uh, and then feeling like, oh, this shoe's done because it stinks and, um, and uh, it, it just feels flat. So uh, I just think it's, it's, if you're serious about running and you're running a lot of times day after day, um, then get a couple pairs of shoes. And, um, and sometimes that can be one that's a little lighter weight, one that's a little thicker. And so you can do your tempo runs in the one that's, uh, so your quicker runs in something that's a little lighter weight. And, um, and that gives you a feeling of speed because it's good when you're doing training programs to not just settle in at one pace all the time. And um, it's good to push yourself. And that's what hill training does and interval training does to, to increase your cadence and your speed. Um, so having shoes that can help with that is, is a good thing. Great, thank you. Does anybody else have, do you have anything you wanna add or does anybody else have any questions that they want to bring up? Now's a good time, I think. I think uh, the other thing, just um, when starting a running program, um, uh, there's a lot of load that happens to the body. So it's just like uh, with your aches and pains and your hips and knees, um, there's going to be those aches and pains to your feet. Um, and um, just listen to the body at times and know when you need to have rest. But um, the um, I've found that uh, that if you're sore certain days, like doing run, doing walk, uh, but it is a fast paced walk. It's just those things don't just stop the running, keep the activity going. So the load's there, but just reduce that, that, that level of load and uh, your body starts to accommodate that over time and uh, strengthen towards that over time. And, uh, um, uh, and nobody can sort of tell you it's normal, um, uh, besides just those aids, those little, little aches and pains, if you know it's 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 really becoming bothersome um, and sore, then find ways to reduce that. And sometimes it's not just stopping, but uh, varying the the level of uh, of load through power walking and stuff like that. Great, all awesome advice. Uh, there's so many shoes out there that it's it's kind of nice to have it broken down and. Um, just knowing what you might be going into the store looking for. In advance. Yeah, and I guess that's the other thing I can comment on is um, the shoe walls are overwhelming. Um, and um, get somebody to help you with that process. Um, um, and uh, go into a store, make sure they're measuring the feet. Uh, uh, you can't, a lot of people are different than what they say. And, um, and so, uh, me, get, yeah, make sure you're getting measured, make sure your foot mechanics are being looked at and then try a variety of shoes on. Don't just, um, uh, don't just try one or two shoes on, try three shoes on. And, um, sometimes it takes even more than that. And if you're getting into insoles and things like that, be prepared to spend a half an hour or 45 minutes. Some people, it takes an hour to get a shoe fit and, uh, uh, don't feel like you're, um, imposing upon or, um, or uh, yeah, not being respectful in the store. I mean, that's what we're here for, is to go through that process. And, and then um, we guarantee all the fits. So uh, if you go out and use the shoes, good stores that, um, that uh, guarantee their fit, um, just want you to be in a good shoe. So if it ends up being that something's not working for you, uh, we'd rather you come back and return that shoe, even if it's worn um, and, um, 
and exchange it for something else than to uh, stop wearing that shoe and go visit some other store and, uh, and not come back because you didn't have success with it. Uh, we'd much rather have uh, somebody come back and uh, we'll take those shoes back. And people are awfully reasonable the vast majority of the time. And so we uh, give the benefit of the doubt in those situations. If something's not working for you, then we trust you and we'll try to find the best we can something that does fit. Awesome. Good to know. All right. Um, thank you so much, Jordan. And thanks everyone for joining us. That was awesome. Um, yeah, if you guys ever have any questions, um, feel free to email me and I can pass them on to Jordan and we'll um, get questions answered for you in the future. Have a good night. Thanks very much, guys. Thank good you. Bye-bye.